Welcome once again to our evening Bible study. Our text for this evening is the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verses 18 to 25. Let me begin by reading this for us. Gospel of John, chapter 2, verse 18. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them, because he knew all men, and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Amen. You will remember that we have just recently considered this very important and significant action of the Lord Jesus near the beginning of his ministry when he went to Jerusalem and cleansed the temple. You remember we saw how the temple had been really denigrated. It had been turned into a house of merchandise, a place for the conduction of business, a place steeped, as it were, in materialism and in covetousness. It had become idolatrous. And when the Lord Jesus was there, when he beheld and saw all these things going on, he acted. He drove out all the buyers and sellers, all the animals, overturned the tables of the money changers, and so on. But after this cleansing of the temple, we find that Jesus enters into a confrontation with the Jews, or rather the Jews confront him about what he has thus done. And this reveals more of their spiritual condition. And this confrontation, the cleansing and the confrontation, are used by the Apostle John in the composition of his gospel as an occasion to bring in a very significant point, which we see in the closing verses of this chapter, the question of commitment or true belief. This is something that is really central to the Gospel account, as we shall see. Well, let's look first of all at the confrontation that took place in verse 18. Of course, all these things that the Lord Jesus had done, this very public and very direct action that he had taken against the abomination of idolatry in the temple, this did not go unnoticed and it did not go unchallenged. Even though the power and the authority with which Jesus acted could not be resisted. Think about it. It must have been a remarkable scene. Here you have the temple area filled with people conducting business. Remember, we're not talking about a handful of people. We're talking about a number of people, a significant crowd, there would have been more than just one or two stalls selling animals. There would have been more than just one or two money changers. This was something that occupied a large part of this area, the court of the Gentiles. And Jesus drove them all out. None of them resisted. None of them stood up to him or was able to stand up to him. He made this whip of small cords, which was probably used for the animals rather than for the people, but other than that, he was just one man in, in the human sense, acting alone. He didn't have a cohort of people with him. The disciples did not participate in this cleansing action. They were not there alongside Jesus, driving people out. This was the Lord Jesus himself, alone, and yet no one could resist. But as much as they could not resist his power or his authority, they still wanted to challenge what right he had to do these things. They demand a sign. That's what we see in verse 18. 
Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? This is something that we see very often in the Gospel accounts. It's almost as though the people are not content with what they have. They keep demanding signs, more and more signs. With all that Jesus does, somehow it's not enough for them. They want more signs. They want more evidence. And this really reveals the obstinacy of their hearts. Even on this occasion, think what they have just witnessed. They have just witnessed a display of something far more than mere human power or mere human influence. They have seen the Lord Jesus single-handedly, irresistibly, driving this whole group of people out of the court of the Gentiles. It's unlikely any mere man would have been able to do this. This was a demonstration of something very special, very significant. This is more than just personal charisma or force of personality. This is something greater than that. And on top of that, they have not only the power and the authority of Jesus, but they also have this demonstration of holiness and zeal. Jesus is not taking any arbitrary action. He is cleansing the temple of God. This should have been significant for them. They should have recognized this as a demonstration of the holiness and righteous zeal of the divine servant. The disciples recognized it. They referred this, you remember, to the Messianic Psalm, Psalm 69. The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. The Jews should have been able to do the same, especially the religious leaders of the Jews, the Pharisees, and those who occupied themselves almost entirely with the study of the Old Testament law. They prided themselves on being children of Abraham and disciples of Moses. And yet they could not see that what the Lord Jesus was doing was in fact a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. For example, if you look at Malachi chapter 3, Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom he seeks shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom he delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi, and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. When they saw this action of the Lord Jesus, cleansing the temple, Surely it should have sparked some recognition in them that this is the Messiah. This is the messenger of the covenant. He has come to his temple. The first part of that prophecy was already fulfilled and they knew it. If you look at Luke chapter 7, Luke chapter 7 and verse 27, here the Lord Jesus speaking of John the Baptist refers to refers to him as a fulfillment of that prophecy of Malachi. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. And the Pharisees knew that John the Baptist was the forerunner, the herald. Remember, they had asked him, and he had told them, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. He told them, I have come to prepare the way. There is one coming after me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. And yet for all that, when they saw the temple being cleansed, their only reaction was to demand a sign. They could not resist the Lord Jesus in that they could not prevent him from cleansing the temple. But they refused to submit to him. They would not bow to his authority. They had to challenge it. And you recognize very significantly that not only did they fail to see the significance 
of the actions of Jesus in terms of what it revealed about who he was, they also failed to see the significance of his actions in terms of what it revealed of their own sinfulness because they had allowed the temple to degenerate to that condition. They had been there and seen the same things that Jesus saw. And yet they never saw it as a spiritual defilement of the temple. When they saw Jesus driving all these animals and the buyers and sellers out, when they heard Jesus say, Make not my father's house a house of merchandise, they should have been pricked to the heart. They should have repented right there and then. What have we done? He is right. This is God's house. And we have allowed it to become a house of merchandise. May God forgive us for what we have done. But these thoughts never cross their minds. Or rather, these thoughts, if they surface at all, are suppressed in their hearts. Because you could make an argument that the Jews actually knew, on some level, the significance of what Jesus had done. They knew that it was wrong for them to have allowed the temple to become like that. And they knew that in acting the way that he did, Jesus was revealing himself to be more than just a man acting arbitrarily or out of pure human motivations. They knew that. You can tell when you look at chapter 3, the very next chapter, how Nicodemus comes by night. And what does he say to Jesus? Verse 2, We know that thou art a teacher come from God. They knew on some level, but they suppressed that knowledge. They suppressed the truth. They refused to fully acknowledge it. They refused to act in accordance to the truth. And so they had to challenge challenge Jesus. What sign do you show? And this is really foolishness and obstinacy on their part. The obstinacy of their hearts is revealed here. But interestingly, you notice that when Jesus answers in verse 19, he gives an answer that is somewhat obscure. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And this may cause us to question, why was Jesus obscure? Why not be plain and clear? Why not tell them very simply and straightforwardly what he, what he meant, what he was trying to say? Why, as it were, cover the truth with this kind of oblique language. You have to remember again that the Jews had already seen and heard more than enough to convince them if they had been willing to be convinced. Really, when the, when the Lord speaks in this somewhat obscure way, it is a judgment on them. It is a judgment for their hardness of heart. They would not take these plain signs they would not lay them to heart. And so the Lord Jesus gives them a sign that they will not understand. And even when it comes to pass, they will not receive it. They will not believe it. He speaks of his resurrection. And of course, we know that when Jesus did rise from the dead, the Jews still, many of them, did not believe. They continued in their hardness of heart. This sign is really a judgment on them because already they had enough and they demand more and more signs. The signs are given now as a judgment. They will not understand. They will not accept. They will not believe. Just as in the parable that the Lord Jesus said in Luke chapter 16, the rich man and Lazarus, I'm sure you know this account, how towards the end of this parable, the rich man is in torment and he asks Abraham to send Lazarus to his father's house. Verse 28 of Luke chapter 16. For I have five brethren that he that is Lazarus may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto, the, unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. This is a very significant passage 
for our understanding of the Jews' reaction to Jesus. In all their demands for a sign, they are not being genuine. They are not being legitimate. They are not even being reasonable. But the key to all this is that they will not hear the voice of God speaking in His Word. They have, indeed, Moses and the prophets. They pride themselves on knowing Moses and the prophets. And yet they will not hear what God's Word actually says. They cover it up with their traditions. They obscure the Word of God. And so when God acts, when the Son of God acts, they cannot see it. They will not believe it. But you see, as much as this sign, as much as this saying of the Lord Jesus is really delivered in judgment, it's not at all a nonsensical saying. It's meaningful. If they would only spend the time to, to ponder, to meditate on it, they would be able to grasp what Jesus was saying. It's not at all meaningless. In fact, it is very significant, even in light of what is just going on here in this, in this moment, in this confrontation. Jesus says, destroy this temple, and all they can think of is the physical building. That was their immediate, as it were, knee-jerk interpretation. In verse 20, 40 and 6 years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? This is obviously not the right meaning of what Jesus was saying. They can see that that interpretation doesn't make sense, but they don't bother to look beyond it. And in fact, they even reveal here their attitude towards the temple. You can see in this statement that they really see the temple not as a place dedicated to the glory of God, but really a place that glorifies their nation. It is to the glory of Israel as a nation, the beautiful temple, the beautiful building with all its gold and its white stone and so on. It's to the glory of the Jews, not to the glory of God. No wonder they think nothing of allowing it to become a house of merchandise. Forty and six years we have been building this temple, this glorious temple that speaks of the beauty of our nation. But you see again that Jesus was speaking of the temple of his body. You see, Jesus knew where their opposition would lead. They would indeed destroy the temple. Of course, Jesus is not commanding them to destroy the temple. He is simply speaking of what they will certainly do. They will destroy the temple of his body. He knows where this opposition will lead. Because if they will not believe, if they will not submit to him, if they will persist in their abominations, in their wickedness, in their twisting and obscuring of God's word, they will never rest until the Lord Jesus is destroyed because he will never condone their abominations. He will speak and act according to the truth. And when they are not of the truth, they will destroy him, destroy this temple. And Jesus indeed speaks of the temple of, of his body in the fullest possible sense. You remember what the Apostle Paul says in Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9. For in him that is in Christ dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In a very real sense, the Lord Jesus is the temple. In him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And by their disregard for the house of God, they reveal how easy it will be for them to destroy even the Son of God, and kill Him. And that's exactly what they will do. If they think nothing of defiling the physical building, they will think nothing of crucifying the Lord of glory. And again, another aspect of this, another level of this, really this wonderful saying of the Lord Jesus, there's a reason why this particular sign is repeatedly chosen by the Lord Jesus in rebuke and in judgment of their perverse insistence 
and their incessant demand for sign after sign. There's a reason why the Lord Jesus says elsewhere that a a wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign and there will no sign be given it but the sign of the prophet Jonah, the sign of the resurrection, the sign of the Lord Jesus risen from the dead on the third day. We look what the Apostle Paul says in Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17 and verse 31. Here in his preaching on Mars Hill in Athens, the Apostle Paul says, that he that is God hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he has raised him from the dead. The sign of the prophet Jonah, the sign of the resurrection, is a sign of judgment. It is the sign that the Lord Jesus himself, the Son of God, the Son of Man, has been appointed by the Father as the judge of all the world, the judge of all mankind. If they will only open their eyes and see it, if they will only grasp this, Jesus is warning them that they stand in the presence of their judge. And if they will not accept him, if they will not believe on him, if they will not trust in him truly, then they will be judged by him and they will not be able to stand in that judgment. All this is there, but they will not see it. All they can see, all they can think of, is the physical building, their own nation, their own pride, their own stubbornness. That is what rules and controls them. And that's the great danger for us. The disciples, of course, remember this. Even they do not fully grasp it until Jesus is risen from the dead. And then they believe the scripture. They believe what Jesus had said. And that really brings us to these last three verses, verses 23 to 25. Because now we're getting to that question of commitment and true belief. The word commit in verse 24 is the same as the word believed in verse 23. We are told that when he was in Jerusalem and performed miracles, many believed in his name. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them. It has the idea of trusting or entrusting yourself to someone. We can almost say many trusted in his name, but Jesus did not entrust himself to them because he knew that their belief was not genuine. And this is the key. This is a major theme of John's gospel. This is something that he spends time developing. He wants us to be clear about the nature of true belief. Because you remember, we've already seen how the theme verse, John chapter 1 verse 14, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We've already seen how this verse is echoed at the end of the Gospel, in chapter 20 verse 31. And this really gets to the purpose of John's Gospel. John chapter 20, verse 31. These are written, these signs are written, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. It's almost as though the Apostle John wants us, by the time we get to this point at the end of his Gospel, to have a good understanding of what true belief really is. So that when we believe, it will be with that true belief that leads us to life through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because these who believe in his name do not really believe. Theirs is not actually a genuine belief. There is such a thing as a false belief, a superficial belief, an apparent belief that is not genuine and not true. Not all who say they believe truly do believe. Not all who claim to or appear to follow Jesus are his true disciples. And the Lord knows. The Lord knows those whom, who have truly committed themselves unto him. And he will commit himself to those who truly believe in him. You remember 
what the Lord Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not done all these things in your name? But Jesus will say, I never knew you. He knows those who are true, those who truly belong to him. In this case, the Lord Jesus knew that their belief was dependent on the miracles. It was not a genuine belief. Their belief was not made, not based on God's word. Their belief, as it were, was sustained only by the miracles. As long as they saw miracles, they would believe. But the moment a greater commitment was called for, that belief would be revealed for the sham that it, that it really was. This is something, again, that we will see repeatedly in the Gospel accounts, especially in John's Gospel, because again, he wants us to have that good understanding of what true belief really is. You see, these people here who believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did, never truly committed themselves to him. They never truly submitted to his authority. They never denied self, never took up the cross, never truly followed the Lord Jesus. And so Jesus did not commit himself to them. I want to just point out to you how the Apostle John has developed this theme up to this point. We've already seen in chapter 1 how the disciples of Jesus begin to follow him. We've seen their belief as something grounded in Scripture. Again and again they say, we have found the Messiah. Look at what in verse 45 of John chapter 1, Philip says to Nathanael, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write. Their belief, their expectation was grounded in Scripture. And we have seen how that belief developed. Because in chapter 2 verse 11 we are told that when Jesus performed that first miracle in Cana, his disciples believed on him. Now they already believed. It's not that they didn't know who Jesus was. It's not that they were not convinced that he was the Messiah. They, they make that confession. Look at what Nathaniel says in verse 49 of John chapter 1. Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. That's quite a full messianic confession. And yet John says again in chapter 2 verse 11, they believe. And I think that speaks of their belief being strengthened by the miracle that they saw. Because their belief was not grounded ultimately in the miracle. It was grounded in Scripture. And that true belief can be legitimately strengthened by miracles, by signs, by the things that the Lord Jesus did. That's the kind of true belief that the Apostle John wants us to have. So that when we read of these signs that Jesus did, we may believe with that true belief that leads us to life. Not like the belief of these Jews in chapter 2 verse 23. Their belief is entirely dependent on the miraculous. It's not genuine. It's a, it's a spurious belief. It's superficial. There's no real commitment. But John deliberately uses the same word believed. Chapter 2 verse 11, the disciples believed. Chapter 2 verse 23, many believed. And yet it is not the same kind of belief. Then why does he use the same word? Why the confusion? Because again, he's making that point. He wants to bring out the danger and the reality of false belief, so that we don't rest easy, as it were, in our belief. Yes, we ought to be secure in the knowledge that we are saved in the Lord Jesus Christ. But we should not rest that security lightly. We should, as, it, as the Apostle Peter says, give diligence to make our calling and election sure. That's why the same word is used, so that we are not complacent, so that we begin to question and examine ourselves. What is my belief like? I read that the disciples believed, then I read that these Jews believed, and yet somehow the belief of the Jews is not genuine. Jesus did not commit himself to them. 
Has Jesus committed himself to me? Is my belief genuine? The Lord knows my heart. What does he know of my heart? Do I know my heart? Have I truly believed? That's the question that we are driven to ask again and again as we read especially the Gospel of John. It's an important question, a question that we need to ask. Because there are many who behave like the Jews here in chapter 2, verse 23. First of all, they behave like the Jews in verse 18, constantly demanding signs, never content, keep insisting that God has not given me enough evidence to believe. When really the truth is they have refused to acknowledge the evidence that is there. They have suppressed the truth, held it in unrighteousness. This is exactly what the Apostle Paul describes in Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 and verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. God hath showed it unto them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. This is something that requires us to examine ourselves. It's one thing for me as an outsider to say this to you if you have not believed in God, that you are suppressing the truth. That may not be something that you like to hear. But the Word of God calls us to examine ourselves, search your own heart, and see for yourself whether this is really true. Have you been holding the truth in unrighteousness? Have you been refusing to acknowledge that yes, there is a God, there is a moral order. There is a law which I have broken. There is a judgment in which I will stand condemned if I stand on my own. There is a need for me to seek salvation, to seek forgiveness, to turn in repentance to the God against whom I have rebelled. See for yourself whether what the Word of God says regarding our hearts is true or not. Then we also see those, like the Jews in verse 23, who appear to believe, but they believe only superficially. And this may be the case for you. It may be the case for me. We have to search and ask ourselves. I may have seen something that appeared to be supernatural, and on the basis of that I believe. But is that a genuine belief? I may have grown up in a Christian family. I may have been surrounded by Christian things. Because of that, I feel that I am a Christian. But is that a genuine belief? We cannot be content with such things. We must probe deeper. You see, the real test of true belief is given to us again by the Lord Jesus as recorded by the Apostle John. And if I can turn you a little bit ahead, the Gospel of John chapter 8. This is a passage that we will come to in due course, but it is significant for our understanding at this point in chapter 2. John chapter 8, verse 30. Again, you see the same theme being brought up. As he spake these words, many believed on him. But what kind of belief is this? Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make, you free, shall make you free. Receiving God's word, and not just superficially, but receiving it with genuine and persevering commitment, abiding in the obedience to God's word, not allured as in the parable of the sower, not allured by the deceitfulness of riches or the cares of the world, not scared away by persecution or affliction or suffering, but enduring and persevering in obedience to the Word of God. 
that is the key, that's the sign, that's the evidence that we have truly known the truth and been set free by the truth. And so we have to search ourselves and make sure that that is the kind of belief that we really have. Let us examine ourselves. Let me close simply by reading to you a passage from 2 Peter with the prayer that the Lord will apply this to our hearts and cause us to search ourselves and help us to see the truth and be convinced one way or the other that we have not truly believed and we need to believe. But if we have truly believed, then we must hold that belief sure unto the end. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. According as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby, I, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. This is God's activity. This is the divine prerogative, as it were. But there is also this responsibility. Verse 5, And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. A faith that is devoid of all these things is not true faith. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see far off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And I hope and pray that this entrance is something that you and I will have. On that, on that day, the Lord Jesus will not say to us, I never knew you. He will say to us, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Have you truly believed in the Lord Jesus Christ? Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, you have said in your word that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? But you, Lord, you are the one who tries the heart. You search the heart. You try the reins. You will give to everyone according to the fruit of his doings. We pray that you would help us to search and examine our hearts, that we may know truly whether we have genuinely believed. We know that there is no salvation outside the Lord Jesus Christ. So, Lord, I pray for each and every one who hears this message, that you will work in hearts to bring true conviction, to bring a true and full and everlasting salvation. All these things we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus and for his sake. Amen.